In 2004, Michael Bell Jr. was shot and killed by the Kenosha police after a questionable traffic stop. Michael was hit and tased and struggled with four officers before he was shot in his own driveway, 10 feet from his mother and sister. Michael Bell died three hours later. He was just 21 years old. Michael was the third of six children in a close-knit family. He was the older brother that patched a skinned knee, the friend that used his paycheck to buy his best buddy a car, and the son who treasured special times with his parents. And like many young men, Michael also had some missteps, including a struggle with alcohol during times of loneliness and stress. But he was leading a full, happy life, starting his own business, and eager for the future. Michael's death left the Bell family numb with grief and shock, but their nightmare was just beginning. A rushed investigation, riddled with glaring contradictions, would leave them feeling hollow and angry. And they struggled to comprehend how everything unfolded so tragically on that awful night. It was November 9, 2004. Michael Bell was parked in front of his house. Officer Eric Straussbaugh ordered Michael to take a breath test, even though the officer's dash cam had revealed no erratic driving. When Michael refused, things quickly escalated. And after being kicked and tased, Michael tried to run up the family driveway. During the struggle, Officer Eric Widener kept Michael's mother and sister at bay. Lieutenant David Kruger was holding Michael from behind in a bear hug. Officer Straussbaugh began screaming that Michael had taken the officer's gun. This led a fourth officer, Albert Gonzalez, to run up to Michael with his gun drawn and at the command of Lieutenant Kruger to shoot Michael in the head. The Kenosha police report stated that Michael was shot because he posed a lethal threat to the four officers. But the evidence told a different story. No fingerprints or DNA from Michael Bell were found on the gun or holster. And according to four eyewitnesses, as shown in this recreation photo, Officer Gonzalez stood between Michael and Officer Straussball, while Lieutenant Kruger held Michael from behind. This should have allowed Gonzalez to confirm that Michael did not have Straussball's gun. But even though there was no forensic evidence that Michael Bell grabbed Straussball's gun or holster, it appeared that someone, or something, had indeed come into violent contact with the weapon. So much so that the officer's holster had been yanked out of position from his hip to the front of his body, causing his terrified screams. But if Michael Bell didn't grab the gun, who or what did? Eight years later, a private investigation would reach a startling conclusion. Brad, Tammy, this is an affidavit from a former Kenosha police detective. It includes his theory of what happened that night in November of 2004. He concludes a car part led to a fatal police shooting. Michael was right here. Michael Bell stands where his son died in the driveway of the family's Kenosha home. I kind of consider this kind of like a holy spot, you know. I mean, this is where your son lost his life right here at this place. But Bell isn't here to mourn. He's here to demonstrate what he and his private investigators believe happened in the moments leading to the death of Michael E. Bell. I have no problem with the fact that the officer might have made a mistake. That is part of his line of duty. Well, that alleged mistake revolves around the driver's side mirror. Fox 6 obtained an affidavit from retired Kenosha detective Russell Beckman. Beckman, who spent nearly 30 years with the Kenosha police, states any reasonably competent investigator committed to objectivity and the truth would have been able to determine Officer Strasbaugh's holstered handgun was caught and captured by the driver's side mirror. He states, the officers involved, and more than likely, the supervising and investigating police officials chose not to tell the truth. The report noted that the mirror had been at the very center of the struggle, leaving it broken and hanging by a cable. It also noted that the KPD virtually ignored the mirror in its findings. In November of 2004, the prospect of a very human but fatal error loomed over the Kenosha Police Department. But rather than leave no stone unturned, its investigation was concluded in less than three days. 
The district attorney said that Michael was shot because the officers believed they were in imminent danger of death and lethal force was necessary. Not addressed was the lack of Michael Bell's fingerprints or DNA on the weapon. The mirror was not mentioned as a possible culprit. The bullet that killed Michael Bell was not analyzed, and multiple witnesses had not been contacted for follow-up interviews. But the officers were awarded citations for meritorious service. The case was closed, but searing questions remained. The Bell family sued the city of Kenosha for the wrongful death of Michael Bell, citing a rush to judgment and a cover-up. The family contended that because Officer Gonzalez stood between Michael and Officer Straussbaugh, the police should have been able to confirm that Michael did not have Straussbaugh's gun. But instead, Lieutenant Kruger ordered Gonzalez to shoot, and he did. The Bells further contended that the KPD knew it had made a tragic mistake and then initiated a cover-up. The Kenosha police presented an entirely different story, stating that Officer Gonzalez was standing in front of the car. From there, he couldn't confirm whether or not Michael Bell had control of Straussbaugh's weapon, but he clearly heard Straussbaugh's terrified screams. The KPD added that Gonzalez purposely angled his weapon toward the windshield to avoid shooting the other officers. The Bell family and their attorneys responded with the evidence. First, that four civilian eyewitnesses said Gonzalez stood to Michael's right and between Michael and Straussbaugh. Second, that the autopsy showed that Michael had been shot on the right side of his head with an exit wound on the back left. Third, the blood on the car was on the hood but not the windshield, consistent with Gonzalez firing from the right side of Michael, not the left. And fourth, that the shell casing ejected from the right side of Gonzalez's weapon was found in the grass and leaves on the right side of the car, also consistent with Gonzalez firing from Michael's right. The Kenosha officers were confronted with these discrepancies during their depositions. Were you able to see the gun pressed against the head of Michael Bell? Yes. Um, would you please stand up in the position that you had Michael Bell? at the time the shot was fired? I was standing behind him and I had my arms around his upper shoulders. Right. And again, Michael Bell was leaning in what uh, posture at the time? He was, he was in front of me and he was more or less like this, leaning over. And uh, officer, uh, we'll strike that, what side of the head was Michael Bell shot in? Left side. All right. And you could see that because officer Gonzalez was to your left? Yes, sir. And you saw Officer Gonzalez with his gun out pointed to, uh, pointed towards Michael Bell's head? Yes. And you saw the muzzle of the gun placed against Michael Bell's head? Yes. And is this the first time that you've given any testimony under oath concerning this case? Yes. All right. Um, and you understand the significance of giving testimony under oath in all matters, including this one. Yes, sir. Right. The autopsy finding, Roman numeral 1H, reads as follows. Trajectory of wound path through head, body and anatomic position, right to left, front to back, and slightly downwards. Did I read that correctly? Yes, sir, you did. All right. Is it still your testimony under oath that Officer Gonzalez was standing in front of the Nissan at the time he put a bullet into Michael Bell's head? Yes, it is. Is it still your testimony under oath that Officer Gonzalez's gun was pointing at the windshield at the time he put a bullet through Michael Bell's head? Yes. Is it still your testimony under oath that Officer Gonzalez had his gun pressed against the left side of Michael Bell's head when he shot him? Yes. And is it still your testimony that Officer Gonzalez was never on the right side of Michael Bell 
at the time he pulled the trigger. That's correct. Caught in a crucial contradiction, the KPD scrambled to reconcile its claim that Gonzalez stood on the left, while the forensic evidence showed that Michael Bell was shot on the right. Eight months later, in December of 2007, KPD presented its answer in the form of a reenactment video. Officers Widener, Kruger, Straussbaugh, and Gonzalez reenacted their actions for the cameras. According to the Kenosha Police Department, Michael Bell had now grabbed Officer Straussbaugh's gun while craning his neck to expose the right side of his head to Gonzalez's weapon. They claimed that this solved the riddle, placing Gonzalez on the left while shooting Michael on the right. But the video did not exonerate the officers. Instead, it had the opposite effect, illustrating that the physical evidence was inconsistent with the reenactment and further suggesting a cover-up. The video depicts Officer Gonzalez firing his weapon point-blank into Michael Bell, with Lieutenant Kruger standing directly in the line of fire. This contradicted the KPD's earlier statements that Gonzalez angled his weapon toward the windshield precisely to avoid shooting the other officers. The medical examiner observed that according to the video, Kruger would have been shot by the bullet passing through Michael Bell's head, and he would have been sprayed with blood and brain tissue neither of which occurred. The medical examiner further noted that according to the KPD video, the shell casing would have been thrown to the left of the car, but it was actually found on the right side of the car. With their defense in free fall, the Kenosha Police Department introduced a third version of the event and a second video to address just one of the discrepancies, the location of the shell casing. The KPD now claimed that Officer Gonzalez held his gun sideways, gangster style, when he shot Michael Bell. They asserted that this would account for the shell casing being thrown to the right side of the car. But even this 11th hour change in story was rejected by the medical examiner. The autopsy showed that Michael Bell had sustained an imprint or muzzle stamp from the gun firing against his right temple. The examiner noted that in order for the muzzle stamp on Michael's head to match the KPD's version of the event, that is, with Gonzalez firing from the front and holding his weapon sideways, Michael Bell would have to have been in an exceedingly distorted position, held from behind with his head turned around 180 degrees and tilted upward. The medical examiner called this scenario forensically impossible. In 2010, the Bell family settled their civil lawsuit against the city of Kenosha for nearly $2 million. But their victory was hollow, because questions of what really happened remain open. Also open is the possibility of criminal charges against Kenosha officials, including perjury, conspiracy, and obstruction of justice. If I can't get this done, then nobody's going to be able to get this done because I have the education and the resources and the commitment to get this done. So uh, I recognize that there's, there's a problem here. And I think after the settlement, Michael Bell Sr. poured his energy and his finances into changing the laws. A man on a mission, his son was killed in a, uh, during a police stop. Now one Kenosha father is trying to change Wisconsin law. And Michael Bell is taking his message to the streets, literally. The billboards, it's a, it's a large gun. Raising a weapon. A smoking gun. And raising a question. And it says, but when police kill, should they judge themselves? For Michael Bell, the answer is no. Six years ago, his son was shot and killed by a Kenosha police officer. This year, the city awarded the Bell family nearly $2 million to settle a civil suit. And now they're doing everything they can to change Wisconsin law. So outside agencies have to investigate officer-involved shootings. We're not against law enforcement, but we're against a process that doesn't have checks and balances. And Bell says he has received negative messages. Some, he says, are from police. But Bell says he won't stop talking about the issue until the law is changed. Sadly, before the law would change, the Michael Bell incident would claim a second life. In October of 2010, Officer Eric Straussbaugh shot himself with his service weapon. He was 34 years old and left a wife and two children. 
Michael Bell's family released this statement. The events of last weekend are just a continuation of the problems that began November 9, 2004. Our family is sickened by the tragic event and is acutely aware of the pain the Strasbaugh family and the law enforcement community feels. Nearly four years later, some positive change as Michael Bell Sr.'s quest became reality. In April of 2014, Wisconsin Act 348 was signed into law by Governor Scott Walker. The law mandates external investigations for police-involved fatalities. Act 348 achieved widespread support from legislators, the public, and law enforcement as a rational solution to the problem of self-investigation. If the law had been in place the night Michael Bell Jr. was killed, that investigation would not have been conducted by the Kenosha Police Department. And with that knowledge, maybe, just maybe, Lieutenant Kruger would not have given a lethal order, or Officer Gonzalez would have thought twice before fatally shooting Michael Bell. And even if the unthinkable had still happened, an outside team of investigators may have chosen a different course and looked thoroughly at all the evidence and avoided a rush to judgment and the subsequent distrust contradiction, expense, and tragedy. The Bell family says the Kenosha Police Department falsely claimed that Michael grabbed an officer's gun and that it ignored evidence to the contrary and then engaged in a deliberate cover-up. In recent years, the specter of other cover-ups and scandal have continued to dog Kenosha County law enforcement. In 2012, several KPD officers issued disputed reports in a controversial tasing incident. Then, the chief of police at the time, John Morrissey, was caught tampering with a supposed independent investigation into that tasing incident. The chief told the investigator to contact him on his personal email to avoid open records. Then, he requested changes to the report, and he also requested that his involvement be kept secret. In 2014, Kenosha officer Kyle Bars admitted to planting evidence during a murder investigation, and a scathing report revealed much more. Kenosha officers never asked for charges to be filed against Bars. He was allowed to stay on the job until January of 2015, when he was then placed on leave. The former DA is also accused of failing to properly notify defense attorneys about the officer's confession until four months later, after the trial was already underway. The report questions the integrity of Kenosha's entire justice system, saying, how can any citizen have confidence in the outcome of criminal proceedings? When all of the evidence was in, it became clear the entire Kenosha law enforcement team acted improperly. The Bell family says that cover-ups like these, combined with the facts of the Michael Bell case, oblige the state to reinvestigate the Michael Bell shooting, but this time with independent investigators, consistent with Act 348. The family also says that a new investigation must include the release of all emails related to the case. Only then will we know the truth about what happened on that awful night in 2004. You can do your part to see that justice prevails. These officials have the authority to order a new investigation into the death of Michael Bell. Please contact one or more of them at the link below and ask them to reopen the investigation for the simple reason that no one should be above the law or the truth. Thank you for watching.